Hi, I'm Jo Grace from The Sensory Project. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there, but I plan to be there online. So if you have these details, you should be able to talk to me as I talk to you, and this will be a more interactive experience than it would have been if I'd been able to attend. I wanted to talk about different views of inclusion and how these affect our practice. The old view of inclusion is it of being a charitable act, helping the poor little disabled children to join in with anybody else. And that's a view that is based however well-intentionedly, on pity, and pity is always corrosive. Under that view, what I do, which is involves the storytelling space, the question would be, how do I enable somebody with a profound disability to access that space? And the answer would be, I do something sensory, I put that in the space, and that's their route into the space. Um, if I was looking at it in a classroom, then my view of my classroom would be that I have these two groups. One, a group of children with special needs and disabilities, one, a group that doesn't have them, and no matter how hard I try to provide for these two groups, I'm always going to be stretched too thinly between them and they're going to vie against each other for my time, attention and resources. Inclusion should be more than that and it should be more than disabled access to buildings and toilets. Although it is shocking that in 2015 we're still asking for toilets for some members of our population. So if you haven't been to changingplaces.org, go there because we need to sort that out. A modern inclusion isn't one based on pity. It's based on respect and understanding, and that is an understanding that we are all different. For some of us, those differences are physically obvious special needs and conditions. For others, they are hidden disabilities, and for the rest of us, there's a whole host of other things that make us different. We all benefit from being included and from having others being included with us. And that's not just the outlier benefiting from being included in the group. That's the group benefiting from including the outlier. And we're beginning to get a recognition of this because things like um, the media reporting that the neurodiversity in our population through the ages has helped with the progression of physics and technology. There was a research study that showed that employing people with learning disabilities has a positive impact on its good business. It increases the productivity and well-being of your other workers. So it's not a charitable act, it's good business sense. And if we're looking at inclusion in that way then our classroom just becomes one group of people because we are all different so we are all in this group and your children with special needs and disabilities are the tip of an iceberg they are your key they are your route to better provision for all of your students because if you're using strategies that support these guys of course they support everybody else things like using a visual timetable or showing what completed work looks like these support students with autism in accessing the curriculum and of course they support everybody else and you might think that the sort of stuff that I do with the sensory things is just for people with profound disabilities, but you'd be wrong. I have a colleague who's a mainstream secondary school teacher. He's an outstanding teacher, and he's just written his master's dissertation on how using sensory techniques in his GCSE classroom supported the learning of his students. So when you think of inclusion as being for everybody and being good for everybody, then you can motivate it from a selfish point of view. And when it becomes driven by self-interest, it's much, you know, there's much more gusto with it going forwards. So thinking of it as a rich form of inclusion, it's not just about how I enable somebody with a profound disability to access this space, because if all I do is put them in this space on their own, they're no more included than they were before. They're just excluded in a different location. It becomes about how I enable other people to access this space too. So when we're thinking of inclusion, we're not just thinking of our students with special needs and disabilities. We're thinking about how we enable other people into this space. And campaigns like Scope's hashtag End the Awkward are about that. I had a glimpse into how it benefits society earlier in the year when I was running the Structured Sensory Art Project, which enabled artists with profound and multiple learning disabilities like Zoe, and Shannon here to independently create works of art. And when I was running that project, I was concerned with how I was going to get the facilitators supporting the artists in the studio to be fully present in the moment and not be thinking about all the other things that they have to do. And my solution to that was to put in a mindfulness practice at the start of the sessions. I hadn't anticipated that as the project ran, I would discover that the artists are people who are supremely good at being mindful these are a group of individuals who are present in the moment, every moment, and who derive joy from it. Then you take a step back and you look at society as a whole at the moment, and you will discover that in our society today, we have a growing diagnosis rate of conditions to do with anxiety. So there is a 
there's a problem that is anxiety in our society. Two years ago, Oxford University published a research study that showed that secular mindfulness practice is preventative of stress, depression and anxiety. And there was a local authority on the radio this week who are pouring loads of money into putting mindfulness practice in schools. So we have a problem. And we recognise that the solution to that problem is probably something to do with mindfulness. And we have a group of people who are supremely good at mindfulness. So clearly society benefits from them being included. And that's just one example. And I'm sure, I hope you have more. Um, and I think as that understanding and awareness of what a rich inclusion is comes to the forefront, we'll see more of it happening. So for me in my practice, what it looks like is I tell a story in a sensory way and then I tell a story that I think everybody would be interested in. And that's how I get everybody into the space. And it's that simple. And I would love to know what it means in your practice. So I hope I will hear from you online. Thank you for listening to me. Bye.